Hello, students. Uh, we're going to get into the real heart of the class with regards to how we process sugars, fats, and proteins, and how all of the different pathways come together to what we call metabolism, how we um, utilize those for energy. Um, this is one diagram. Uh, if you like this one, I would might go ahead and if you want to just print it out because it's kind of the big picture. Uh, I have to tell you, though, I inserted another one that I like a little bit better just because it's more simple. And and maybe the reality is I, I'm not into the gray color. I don't know. So um, let me click. I kind of like this blue one better. Um, so what I want to you guys to understand is where we're headed. I'm gonna make sure that I don't have the red pen because the red kind of bothers me. So I'm gonna go with purple. So what we did in the class is we studied proteins, right? We studied fats, lipids, and we just finished up carbohydrates. And so now we need to ask the question, how are they broken down? And how did those pathways relate to one another? So uh, we had a little bit of insight into that by the fact that in the last chapter, we talked about hormones and the hormones that are going to play a role are going to be a hormone called insulin and then the one that has already been mentioned to you was epinephrine and glucagon the other important part here will be vitamins and I do have to give you an intro to that when we get there, when it becomes important in our discussion. And then the other part to our, to understand what are our key organs that we're looking at. So remember in biochem brain, liver, and skeletal muscle dominate our discussions. And then the other one, that's important to our adipose cells, fat cells. But we'll see that in most of our discussion, we're looking at brain, liver, skeletal muscle, and adipose cells. Okay. All right. So what are we doing today? Well, let's see. As we approach, approach this diagram, what I want you to think about here, here's glycogen. We, we practice writing the structure. And the one thing that we learned from last test is that the hormone signal from epinephrine or glucagon will signal the G protein and phosphorylation cascade that triggered the release of glucose from glycogen, which would be this arrow here that I've highlighted in purple. Okay, uh, glycogenolysis is the fancy name for the breakdown of glycogen into glucose 6-phosphate. Okay, so we've kind of talked about that. And when will that become important? We'll leave that discussion for later. But I think you can tell is that we'd want to, we need more glucose if we need more energy or if our blood sugar levels are low. Okay. Um, at the same time, we talked about the activation of that process. We said, okay, well, it would not be efficient that we'd store glucose at the same time we're breaking it, uh, that it wouldn't be efficient if we're storing glycogen in the same time we're breaking it down. So that other pathway gets shut off. Okay. So with all this in mind, um, let's uh, talk a little bit about where we're headed. Uh, we, in this lecture, are going to be focusing on glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, two very, very important pathways in biochemistry. And then in later lectures, we're going to keep going. We're going to be addressing acetyl-CoA. If you notice, it's kind of the center of this diagram, and it's super important. A lot of arrows coming into it and going out of it. So that is going to be a very important discussion. Uh, the other thing uh, we're going to be looking at is citric acid cycle and electron transport chain. That, those sets of reactions are going to have the outcome of making ATP. We're also going to be talking about how fats are metabolized for energy and when fats would get stored.
One thing that's absent from this diagram that I'd like you to add in is something called a ketone body. And we're going to ask the question of when do they become an issue? And they serve as an, actually an alternative fuel for the brain. Okay. And um, lastly, it's our friends, the proteins. I feel in some ways that you guys are the protein generation because over the last, I don't know, six years, proteins have become really important and dominate discussions. Uh, but we'll see that the biochemistry suggests that they are important, but not in the ways perhaps that you think. That if we look on this side of the diagram, proteins main role will be to replenish tissue protein. So to serve as the building blocks of structural proteins and enzymes. Related to the metabolism of proteins, there's this really important arrow that links that metabolism to urea cycle. And so uh, urination then becomes a way of eliminating ammonia, NH3, that comes from the metabolism of proteins. Okay, so um, let me take a look. One last thing, there's this arrow here from pyruvic acid to lactate or lactic acid. Uh, we will be covering that today. So there's certain situations where pyruvate will form lactic acid. Okay, so I'm excited about this. So let's keep going. So here's our overall reaction of glucose plus oxygen to make CO2 and water. And the oxygen is, um, the we breathe that in, right? So that's from breathing. And then here's that CO2 that we talk so much about reacting with water to form the uh, carbonic acid by carbonate, breathing out the CO2 that um, attaches to hemoglobin. And then of course we talked about oxygen, right? Binding hemoglobin. So we've kind of looked at this equation, but kind of indirectly. Okay, so let's see all the different way, pathways that are gonna be involved in this, what appears to be simple equation. Energy is always involved, right? It's the answer to a lot of things of why things happen. And so we're going to, for every process, be looking at it from a th thermodynamic value and I know you just had your test, so delta G is negative for a process that's spontaneous. Okay, so that is something you should know. And then here's our friend ATP, that um, its hydrolysis releases free energy. And part of the reason for that is it's highly charged, right? So this has a lot of charge to it. So when it's when this bond splits, uh, there's a release of energy uh, in terms of or well, what's helping it to be more stable is the fact that you have less charge repulsion. What we also saw though over the course of the semester is that usually what's involved is that that phosphate, phosphorylate something else, right? So this will phosphorylate. And it's really in that phosphorylation process, you get a lot of energy. Okay, so um, the energy released is 32.2 kilojoules per mole or 7.3 kilocalories per mole. And this just describes uh, where you're getting a lot of the energy from, is from the separation of negative charge, increased entropy, and resonance stabilization. Thioesters, hold that thought. We'll see it more in the next lecture when we talk about acetyl-CoA. Okay, so this slide, I won't read it to you. You, you can read it on your own here, but um, what I want you to think about is really what's going on with pathways. 
why will we see a whole bunch of individual steps in a process? Okay, so um, there's some things about pathways that are really important. If we have a series of steps, well, when they're in a series of steps, they may not all be exergonic. Some might be endergonic. So let's say that center one there is plus and it's sluggish to go forward. Because remember, the, that would be reverse reactions dominates. Well, there's going to be two major ways that we take care of that in the body. We don't have a temperature gauge that we can increase the temp and make it go forward. So one way is that we can couple it to the hydrolysis of ATP. Right? So if we can, we'll need energy. So that's one way that um, we can push reactions that are not spontaneous is reaction coupling. The other thing that's really important is that when you have a pathway, one of the neat things that happens is that you can have a negative delta G in the last step and from Le Chatelier's principle, you can pull the ones that don't want to go forwards, forwards. So I'm going to highlight D here. Okay, let's picture it is very favored. That delta G is negative. The forward reaction is really favored. So it's going to go forward. What does that mean in regards to D then is that you see a decrease in the amount of D. Now, what does Le Chatelier say is that it's going, the previous reaction is going to want to replace it. So what's that going to do? It's going to pull this down. And then that's going to pull the previous one down. And so now that is going to help processes that were endergonic happen. So reaction, reaction coupling is one. And then another thing that helps in pathways is that we can rely on Le Chatelier's principle. Okay, to move things towards product. Okay. So here's that picture again. It's possible that you like this one better. I think uh, for myself, there's something about it that, um, I don't know, maybe it's the colors on it. I like the, bl the blue one better, but it's, it's okay if you like this one better. Um, it's really the same diagram. The only difference is that the proteins are over on the right side and the lipids are over here on the left side. But what this is showing you is one other thing. All these pathways interconvert, inter over overlap, I'm sorry, uh, integrate with each other. And one of the things that can come out of that is the idea that we can have regulation of these pathways. And if you recall from all the hard work you did in understanding enzymes, is that the enzymes can be regulated. Okay, and we're going to rely on some of the ideas that we've learned before is that sometimes regulation occurs through phosphorylation or dephosphorylation. Okay. So glycolysis is carried out in the cytosol of the cell. So if you have a cell, you can have a nucleus, right? Nucleus, you can have a mitochondria. The cytosol would be it just in the, the cytosol, the, um, not within a special organelle. Okay, I won't read this slide to you. This is just an overview. Everything we're going to talk about 
um, in a few minutes because we're going to go through it step by step. So you can come back and read this. It's kind of the overview of it. Okay, so there's what's called phase one, which is energy investment phase of glycolysis. We're going to start off with our friend glucose. Hopefully you recognize this as glucose, right? Alpha glucose. And um, the very first step is requires energy. And so ATP is required to get this to go forward and phosphorylate glucose 6-phosphate. The enzyme for that is called hexokinase. And then if you notice that here's the phosphate group was added. Okay, next is glucose 6-phosphate forms fructose 6-phosphate. The enzyme is glucose 6-phosphate isomerase. And so isomerase gives us a hint that there, an isomeration is going to happen. And so you go from a six-membered ring to a five-membered ring. Next up is phosphofructokinase, also requires ATP to form fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And uh, that enzyme, phosphofructokinase, is one of the most famous in biochemistry, EFK. And we're going to talk more about that. And then fructose 1,6-bisphosphate cleaves. So if you notice here, there's this is a six-carbon ring. Uh, or, yeah, the ring is actually one, two, three, four, five-membered ring, but it has six carbons. So it's going to split in half to form glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Okay, so if you're getting a little bit worried, we're going to go through each of the steps here in just a minute. So this is our overview. But the idea here is that we have to put in energy. So this requires two ATP. Okay. The next phase is the ener energy generation phase. And so um, part of this discussion will include looking at an electron carrier called NADH. Okay, so uh, there's redox reactions essentially that happen. And so uh, we're going to generate uh, an electron transfer reaction and uh, that's gonna form one, three, bisphosphoglycerate, and then here's a very important reaction in step seven where you have what's called substrate level phosphorylation and you form 3-phosphoglycerate and ATP is generated. Okay, you have another steps eight, nine, and 10 we're going to look at those individually here in a minute. La and it's really this last step where you're going to make ATP again. Now, if you recall, let's go back in one of the slides. At this point down here, at this point here, dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate this one was split into three, two three-carbon molecules. And then one of them here converts to the other one. So what this means is that the second part of this pathway goes through twice. So this part happens two times for each glucose. So you see on this diagram where everything has a two in front of it. Okay, and that's because the process is going twice through. 
So the net, eight, I'm sorry, the ATP formed in the payoff phase is four ATP, two NADHs. Those are electron carriers, and I have a picture of NADH in a next PowerPoint. So we'll talk, we'll look more closely at its structure. So you have four ATPs, but remember we invested two from the other part, phase one. So notice here, two ATPs are generated. So that is the net amount of ATP. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll come back to this. Okay, so here's another picture. Um, I don't know which one you prefer, uh, but here's kind of going back through each of the steps. Uh, there's 10 steps, and we're going to um, uh, we're going to look at these individually. Now, what I would recommend is printing this out. Just a slide. It just helps to have a have it on one piece of paper. Okay. All right. So let's take a look. Reaction one uh, is hexokinase. Uh, one of the important things about hexokinase that I find interesting and want to highlight for you is that um, it has a cofactor. You asked me about cofactors one time during, I think, one of our Zoom meetings. A cofactor will be uh, in a metal ion that is in the active site of that enzyme. And so um, this is where the idea of minerals comes into play. Now, from our discussions of hemoglobin, we saw the importance of iron, right? Iron too. So in this case, it's not iron, but magnesium. And what is its role within the active site of that enzyme is that this particular process requires ATP. So ATP, if you recall, highly charged and very negative. So that cofactor with its plus charge is going to help stabilize ATP coming in to the active site of that enzyme. Okay, um, this particular reaction uh, is endergonic. That's why it needs ATP. Okay, and uh, this particular step is irreversible. So once the glucose commits to this step, it's it. It's going to stay uh, going towards glucose 6-phosphate. The other word, kinase suggests that there's a phosphate transfer going on. Okay. All right. So um, overall, because there's a phosphorylation event happening, uh, we see a delta G of negative 16.7 kilojoules. And um, one little distinction this not symbol would be from thermodynamic tables in the back of a book that you could calculate in theory. But in theory, the delta G values are for all, all solutions are one molar. All gases would be one atmosphere. Okay, and that may not be the case in the body, right? It's not a it's not standard conditions, which is why do you see how this delta G is different? Because it's in in cells, physiological, and why they don't include the little not symbol, because we're not under standard concentrations for things. Okay, uh, really great concept here, I love it, is that once glucose enters into the cell, yay for glucose transporters, right? Um, they get it into the cell. In the cytoplasm or cytosol of the cell, you have this process where glucose is converted to glucose 6-phosphate. Well, now it's highly charged, so highly charged 
that it's not going to be able to go back out. That transporter is not going to let it flow back the other direction. So the affinity is different and it can't cross the plasma membrane easily. It's committed now to staying in the cytoplasm. Okay. Um, the second step is glucose 6-phosphate converted to glucose, sorry, to fructose 6-phosphate. And um, this is with an isomerase. Okay. And so this is um, hexose phosphate isomerase. Okay. It is at the conversion from a keto to an aldol, glucose to fructose. If that doesn't make sense, then go back and take a look at those structures from the previous PowerPoint, okay? Or look at that in your book uh, with regards to the terminology of keto, ketose and aldose. All right, so um, this step's not necessarily particularly exciting, but it's going from a six-membered ring to a five-membered ring. Okay, now uh, phosphofructokinase, PFK, is one of my favorite enzymes. And it's a major point in the regulation of glycolysis. So fructose 6-phosphates phosphorylated again to make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So you see how it has two phosphate groups. And I should probably remind you that when it's drawn like that, it's an abbreviation for this, right? Okay, so OP, it's just not showing the rest of it. Okay, uh, this is coupled, right, to the hydrolysis of ATP. We need a source of the phosphate. Uh, this is the committed step. If it does this step, it means that it's committed itself to glycolysis. All right, um, now why, let me just stop here for a second. Let me go back. Oh, all the way back. Wow, when I, when I said I was going back, I really meant it. Should just, okay. Um, oh, it's not even on that one. Yikes, I'll be able to click forward really easily. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay. Um, we just said that hexokinase is going to get us from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. Okay, that's not the committed step in glycolysis because remember, glucose 6-phosphate can build up and form glycogen. So it has choices there. It can go to glycogen or it could go into glycolysis. So the committed step um, the committed step is here, phosphofructokinase. Okay, and that's gonna be a major, major point of regulation. What kinds of things are going to shut down this enzyme? Well, it's going to be inhibited by ATP. That's important because if you have a lot of ATP, right? If you have a high amount of ATP, why would you want to go make more in glycolysis? So this is going to shut this down or slow this down. Um, if I look at my equation, If I have high amounts of ATP, okay, then um, that's going to shut this down. If I have high amounts of ADP, that means I don't have as much ATP, right? And what's that going to do? It's going to stimulate this enzyme to go forward because you're going to need ATP. So um, too much ADP, this guy, means you don't have enough ATP. 
Okay. Next step, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. If you notice, supercharged molecule, very charged, kind of cramped, right, with the negative charged charges. So it's not a big surprise. It's going to fall apart into two three-carbon molecules, dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The enzyme here is called aldolase, and uh, it has some essential side chains like lysine and aspartate play a key role in catalysis. We're not gonna look at the specifics on that. And it's not really, um, well, what's really important then though, is that this is at this point, uh, dihydroxyacetone phosphate is going to form glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So this is where you're going to double up and have two of these for every one glucose. So here's that conversion, dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glyceraldehyde three phosphates. Okay. And the delta G here is positive. And so the question's going to be, how does this happen? when we have uh, steps that don't really wanna go forward. Now, plus 2.5 kilojoules is not a very large value. It's, and it's actually kind of around zero. So if you notice as the double arrows were reversible, but as we keep moving forward, the question's gonna be, how are we going to keep these moving forward if they're reversible? Okay. So here we are in the energy payoff phase. So you have two of these, right? To form two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, we'll form two 1,3-diphosphoglycerate. Uh, so there's going to be uh, two NADHs formed. And uh, this reaction involves... Um, the addition of a phosphate, but the phosphate here, see where it says PI? That's inorganic phosphate. Meaning that it's in the cytosol. So it's not from ATP. Um, this involves, this whole process involves electron transfer. So if you recall from your previous chemistry, that um, electron transfer reactions are redox. And so what's going to happen is the NAD plus, there'll be two of them, will make NADH. So this is a reduction, reduced. And so there is an oxidation that must be going on at the same time. Okay, and where do we see the oxidation? Here. Right, the gaining of oxygen right there. Okay, and the times two is because we have two glyceraldehyde three phosphates. Okay, here's a really important part is now we're going to start and there's these are times two, right? This is a really important step because finally, after all this effort, we make ATP. When you make ATP directly from an enzymatic process, it's called substrate level phosphorylation. Okay, and um, we have then the production of ATP. So the phosphate group here, whoops, was transferred. So the phosphate group here was tr is transferred on to the ADP. 
okay? And there's some stability uh, in getting rid of that charged species. You have some um, a resonant stabilization over here in the carboxylate ion, okay? And this is gonna pull some of the um, previous reactions through, but we'll see more of that as we keep moving down in the reaction chain. Now we have three phosphoglycerate to two phosphoglycerate, and the enzyme is phosphoglycerate mutase. Okay, and um, not a super exciting reaction. If you notice here, you have a change. The only thing that's happening is the phosphate groups moving from this carbon to this other one. Okay. Okay, now there is what's called uh, a 2 phosphoglycerate uh, produces a really interesting molecule called phosphoenolpyruvate. And one of the things that should strike you about this particular molecule is how unusual it is. It has a lot going on. It's got the carboxylate group, it's got a phosphate group, and it has the double bond. Um, it's what we would call an enol intermediate. And the key idea here, and this is really important, is it's really unstable. And it, that, it's that instability that explains the next step, which is the last step in the process. Phosphoenolpyruvate is going to be unstable. It's going to want to get rid of that phosphate group, and it's going to transfer it to ADP to make ATP again. And remember, these are always two. And it's going to form pyruvate, the end of our process here in glycolysis. And um, this, again, is substrate-level phosphorylation, the making of ATP from a direct enzymatic process. And this is super exergonic. And it's this step that's pulling the processes the previous that were a little sluggish and reversible. Uh, in a, it, that's why they're in a chain, because this last step pulls them through. I picture kind of like a rope pulling the previous reactions through. So the fact that phosphoenolpyruvate is such an unstable enol intermediate helps explain why this last step is so exergonic. Okay. Um, what I want to do is take a look at this one slide. Let me skip these. I like the energetic slides here. Okay, so these charts will help us to think about delta Gs and kind of the big picture of the free energy flow. Okay, and so there's it's what it's really showing you is that there are three very, very negative uh, delta G values within the process. If we look specifically, um, well, actually four, so let's take a look here. Uh, this is delta G under standard conditions, under standard state, and then here's in erythrocytes, which are red blood cells. So this one's more interesting because it's a physiological delta G, so let's focus on that one. Okay, if you notice, step one, exergonic, right? Releasing free energy. So that's exergonic. Step 10, super exergonic. And then step three. Okay. Um, I have to think about where that step 11 is coming from. Let's, because there was only 10 steps. I'm not sure what, where, this is from your book or from a different um, graphic. Okay, so uh, three of the 10 steps here, right, up to glycolysis steps, uh, have a large negative delta G, 
The rest, if you notice, some are endergonic, some a little bit exergonic, but they're all kind of hover around zero, which means that they're pretty reversible. But what is driving the process? What is really driving the process is that you have these very three large negative ones. So overall, the process is exergonic. So in other words, we're looking at the big picture of what's the overall release of free energy. Overall, the process of glycolysis releases free energy, even though some of the steps required energy in the form of ATP. Uh, the other thing too then is what parts of glycolysis are going to be um, uh, important in terms of regulation are going to be steps one, three, and 10. Okay, so steps one, three, and 10 are going to be the sites of regulation. And we will be talking about that in a few minutes. So let's finish up with our energy diagram here, another way of looking at it. Um, here, you start off with glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. See that HK? That is hexokinase. Phosphofructokinase and pyruvate kinase. So that's step one, step three, step 10. Those are our main regulatory points. Now take a little side note in your mind to also understand then that gluconeogenesis, the process of going back from pyruvate to glucose, will not be able to go backwards in steps one, three, and 10, because those are very much forward reaction. So what's gonna happen here is that gluconeogenesis will have different steps in those places. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. Okay, the other thing too, is that see this part here, which is highlighted, those middle steps are reversible, so they can go either way. But um, so if this process, step 10, pulls it forward, then it's going to pull all of these towards products. That's the advantage of having them in a pathway. OK, so the main points of regulation is uh, step one, step three, and step 10. Okay, so those are our major control sites. Uh, one of the interesting things, let's look at step one, glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, that is inhibited, that enzyme hexokinase, is inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate. So its own product of the reaction can inhibit it. Pretty interesting. Um, the phosphofructokinase has all sorts of regulation, and we'll see a little bit more detailed slide later, but the easiest one is to realize that in high amounts of ATP, you're going to shut that enzyme down so you don't waste resources going through glycolysis. So in high amounts of ATP, you're going to shut that step down. And same thing with our last step of pyruvate kinase. Why waste resources? You're going to see in high amounts of ATP, that enzyme is going to get shut down, slowed down. Okay. All right. I know I skipped some slides earlier. Um, this is my normal flow. So um, 
normally in lecture, I'm a little more free form. So I feel really tied to this PowerPoint, intensely tied to it. So um, after this video lecture, I'll go back and look at what exactly I, I, I clicked on. If I have to clarify in one of our Zooms, I will. Okay, so don't worry too much about it right now. Um, okay, so glucose. I really like this slide because it kind of shows you our main players that we look at in biochemistry, brain, skeletal muscle, and our friend, the liver. The only other one that could come up as well that we talk about are red blood cells. But uh, for the most part, brain, muscle, and liver dominate. The brain requires 120 grams of glucose out of the 160 needed by the entire body. So our brains need sugar. This is an unfortunate fact, I think, for students who have, like you guys probably, that have grown up as, again, kind of the protein generation where carbohydrates have been slammed and said, you know, we, we, we don't need them or they've been vilified. But the reality is the biochemistry will tell us we need glucose. The problem is the American diet has too much glucose, right? And there's ways of getting it in a much healthier way. Our starches in, um, uh, in vegetables is a great way to get it versus, let's say, a Snickers bar. But one, what I want to tell you is that we need glucose for our brains. And I think and I don't want to be sexist, but the messages, especially that women get, because we have a society that's based on uh, looks and thinness, the messages we get are, hey, be thin, be thin, be thin. And that's all fine and good. But anytime we're on any sort of crazy diets, um, the, the question we should be asking is how is our brain going to get glucose? And that question's never addressed in magazines, correct? No one's, you probably never read an article in there that says how important it is for the brain to get glucose. So um, it's going to be a theme of ours. And so I'm not saying run out and, and have, um, uh, massive amounts of Coca-Cola or candy or, you know, I'm not saying that. Uh, but what I am saying that the, the fact that glucose has been vilified and said, and said, hey, you can't have any, you shouldn't have any, that's not accurate in terms of what our body's asking for in terms of how our bodies are built. Okay, so the brain needs glucose. All of the biochemistry that we study from a perspective of how all these pathways ties together, the whole goal is to, going to be to protect your brain's glucose supply. Okay, and that is noticeably absent from our common culture that wants you to try all sorts of different diets. And so We'll hold that thought as we move forward. Uh, the way we store glycogen in the body, it, as the way we store glucose is through glycogen. And remember that it is so polar, it's going to have a lot of water attaching to it. So the amount of glycogen is limited. Okay, is limited. And the body really only contains about one day supply of glucose. So this will come into play, that little fact, when people um, are fasting for long periods of time or are starving or, you know, that's going to be an important fact there that we don't, we only have a one day supply of glucose from glycogen. Okay. The other important fact is that if glucose is depleted, Glucose must be synthesized from other sources. And this is gluconeogenesis. So I'm not sure 
if in your bio classes, you talk a lot about gluconeogenesis, um, but it is going to be huge for us. Okay, gluconeogenesis is primarily, primarily done in the liver. So the liver is a huge place for gluconeogenesis. And it's going to be the making of glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors. In a few minutes, we'll talk more about that. Um, it's going to be from making it from pyruvate is one. Oxaloacetate. Okay. Uh, another one um, is going to be uh, amino acids. Now, not directly, but eventually we're going to see that there's some amino acids that are said to be glucogenic, meaning that they can be pulled to make glucose. Okay, now, not to get too ahead of ourselves then, but if somebody is fasting for a long period of time and they've depleted all their glycogen, then what can happen then is the body's like, uh-oh, I need glucose, and it can start pulling from your proteins to make glucose. In all my years teaching this class, I think that that's kind of the biggest surprise to students. Um, and so that is an interesting point, and we will talk about that in more depth. Um, the other part, it's not on this slide, but just as an FYI, we can't, we can't make glucose from fats. So I'm going to write that little fact. So we can make glucose from amino acids through pathways, but we can't make glucose from fats. And it's such a shame because what does that mean is that if we're low on sugars and we have to go into gluconeogenesis, we can't pull from our fats to make glucose, which is, so in other words, one of the reasons why we get we can get fat is because um, they go to store they can be stored in excessive amounts of glucose but we don't directly pull from them when we get low blood sugar okay and um, that's where something called a ketone body comes in but we're ahead of ourselves okay so the liver The liver is the most active gluconeogenic tissue, meaning it's the main site of gluconeogenesis. And so um, what can happen, and I like the slide, is that um, glycogen can be stored in skeletal muscle. There's a lot of it in the liver too, but some is stored in second place would be skeletal muscle. Glycogen from a hormonal signal can release glucose. Glucose can form pyruvate, so that's our glycolysis. And then um, one of the fates of pyruvate, and I believe there's still some slides coming up here, but one of the fates of pyruvate is that it can form something called lactate or lactic acid. Okay, we've all experienced this. This is going to happen when you have O2 depletion. You've ran really hard, you're sprinting super hard, and you feel you need extra muscle contraction for that. O2 is depleted. And uh, what happens is that pyruvate is converted to lactic acid. That lactic acid then will be... Um, uh, used in the liver for gl making glucose and gluconeogenesis. So 
amino acids can form glucose, not shown in this diagram. Pyruvate can, a molecule called oxaloacetate. We'll get to next lecture. And then also lactate, lactate ion or lactic acid. And that process of converting lactic acid to glucose is called the Cori cycle. Okay, so um, this is what I just said. So if you have vigorous anaerobic exercise, meaning that you have low O2, now you're sprinting hard, okay, then lactic acid from the muscles transported to the liver and converted to glucose. So the liver shares in helping us through vigorous exercise. Okay. All right. Um, let's take a look at this slide. I know I skipped that last one. It was just kind of a repeat. Okay, remember our three steps in glycolysis, these are the enzymes, step one, three, and 10, super negative delta Gs. Those are irreversible. They don't go backwards because they're forwards. The rest of the steps in glycolysis were reversible. Okay, what that means, let's go over here to this side. See the purple one, the purple arrows. Purple, right? Glycolysis, 10 steps. Not all 10 are shown here. Okay. Ends up forming pyruvate. Okay. Under times where you don't want glycolysis, instead, you need to make glucose. Uh, that is when you have low glucose, okay? Um, then the process of going backwards from pyruvate back up to glucose, and I'm gonna switch my color in blue. Notice, I actually think I'll use the highlighter. Step 10, step uh, three, and step one the three steps here. They can't happen like normal in glycolysis. They need a different path. They need a different enzyme. So the instead of being in step 10, pyruvate kinase, you have two enzymes, pyruvate carboxylate and phosphoenolpyruvate carboxykinase. So you have two enzymes. Instead of ph phosphofructokinase, you have fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. And then glucose 6-phosphate back up to glucose is a different enzyme, glucose 6-phosphatase, not hexokinase. So the important part here for us is the reverse Gluconeogenesis is not the reverse of glycolysis. Okay, now key players in when when uh, you will have one process over another, that's all going to depend on what's happening in the body. If you have low glucose. That is going to favor gluconeogenesis. When you brain, when the brain needs glucose, it's going to favor it. Interestingly enough, it happens in the liver, but the liver is going to say, hey, we need more glucose, and then make it to transport it out to the brain. So on this side, low glucose, gluconeogenesis, yeah, it happens in the liver, but it's going to export to brain. 
also export to muscles if you're in um, that state where you need more muscle contraction. Uh, the key molecules that we think of when we think of um, gluconeogenesis, again, it's the making of glucose. In the previous slide, lactic acid was one, pyruvate, oxaloacetate, and then where some of these come from is the next question. We're going to see oxaloacetate comes from Krebs cycle. It can also come from some amino acids. And I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves, but what I want you to think about is gluconeogenesis going to happen when the body needs glucose for the brain primarily. And when that happens, you're going to pull from amino acids and you're going to pull from other intermediates to try and make glucose. But it's not the reverse of glycolysis because of the three irreversible steps. Um, these are highlighting the uh, key steps of gluconeogenesis. I'm just going to highlight something that is really important, but it's a little bit ahead of us. Um, here's oxaloacetate. I just want to make a note. This is a citric acid cycle intermediate. Now, what that means is if the body needs glucose, it's not as concerned with using glucose for energy. And so oxaloacetate is going to get diverted from citric acid cycle. And if that's happening, that's going to slow citric acid cycle down. I'll come back to that. Okay. All right. So pyruvate to oxaloacetate is the first step. Um, one of the interesting points here is we start to look at the role of vitamins. Biotin is a vitamin. And vitamins are important because they tend to be coenzymes. They tend to be part of the active sites in some way of some enzymes. So let's stop here for a second, going back to the idea that our culture is fo focused and fixated on being thin, on dieting. So the first question is when, when your friend says, hey, let's go on this diet together. Your first question is, how is my brain going to get glucose? And your second question is, how am I going to get vitamins and minerals? Because the enzymes need vitamins and minerals. Okay, so enzymes need minerals because of the fact that they are used as cofactors. By, uh, enzymes need um, vitamins because they serve as coenzymes. They're part of that mechanism in some way, the mechanism of the enzyme. So um, those are critical factors. It's also why if you want to get glucose from starches, plants, plant-based diets. That's great because guess what? Those, those plant-based diets also have vitamins. The problem is, is if you're getting your glucose from, uh, you know, the, the big um, Cokes from 7-Eleven, then you're just getting sugar and you're not getting vitamins. Okay. All right. I'm not going to go through that mechanism. Here's another step to um, uh, for gluconeogenesis, oxaloacetate to phosphoenolpyruvate. Okay. Uh, here's bypass three and two. So these were the other steps that were bypassed, have a different mechanism. So steps 10, three, and one of glycolysis have a bypass in gluconeogenesis. Okay, now what this means is that um, in terms of energy is if you were trying to reverse glycolysis without bypassing those, uh, so I'm going to put no bypass 
of steps one, three, and 10, then that's a plus, not good, not favored. But gluconeogenesis with those bypassed steps it can work. Our delta G is negative 42.7 kilojoules per mole. Okay. So this chart, I believe, is really important because it shows the regulation of these processes. And uh, so the purple side there, the purple arrows are um, looking at glycolysis. So what's going to activate glycolysis? What is going to, to make it want to go forward? Okay. Um, one of the things that's so important is that if you're low on ATP, well, let me use the purple pen there, right? That would make more sense to keep it, it color coded. Oh, Uh, low on ATP means high amounts of ADP and AMP. So ATP can dephosphorylate to ADP. ADP can dephosphorylate again to AMP. So triphosphate to diphosphate to monophosphate. Okay, if you're low on ATP, you're going to be high on ADP. You're going to have too much. Okay, see the purple ones, the purple boxes, that means you're going to promote glycolysis, which means these guys are going to want to go to pyruvate. Okay, so um, now if you are have too much ATP, you see here, too much ATP. Well, we don't want to waste resources. It's going to shut down step three, phosphofructokinase, and you're not going to move forward. So that is uh, true there, right? Um, okay, so Notice here, step 10, you have too much ATP, you're going to shut down pyruvate kinase. Earlier up on the step, okay, so, uh, okay, so that's kind of the, the big picture then. Too much ATP is going to shut down glycoly glycolysis. Uh, if you're low on ATP, you're going to activate it. All right, now, the reverse process is gluconeogenesis. So what is going to um, activate gluconeogenesis will be um, when you have a need to make uh, glucose. And uh, what's going to happen there is that um, our mo next molecule that we're going to study, acetyl-CoA, when you have high amounts of acetyl-CoA, um, then that's going to promote uh, the formation of glucose. So that's going to activate this. Now, there is one more thing here, and it gets now it starts to get super complicated. Um, there's another molecule that's actually more at the heart of the regulation uh, that I feel compelled to tell you, but it just starts to create layers and layers. It's this one here, F26BP, which doesn't sound like a molecule, right? So let's take a look on the next slide. So if you notice, like that one's really in both, um, in both uh sides. On the one side, you see how it activates glycolysis, see that green? And then on the other side, it, it activates um, gluconeogenesis. So to be honest with you, 
that's probably one of the, mo mo the most central ways that these two processes are regulated so that you wouldn't want to have both of them activated at the same time. One gets shut down, the other one gets activated and vice versa. Okay, so um, here's phosphofructokinase, PFK, interesting uh, enzyme. Uh, let's take a look. Let's look at the second one here. Okay, when you have low amounts of ADP, ATP, excuse me, low amounts of ATP, that means you have high amounts of ADP. And then do you see right here, that ADP binds to the enzyme at an allosteric site. So remember what allosteric means, not the active site. And what that means is that it's going to do a conformational change that is going to make this enzyme much more active for glycolysis. So low ATP, it means high ADP, it binds, then we do our conformational change. And then what does that mean? We see an increase in PFK activity and we see an increase in glycolysis. Now, I, I love that picture because um, do you see how it produces a lower KM? So it becomes more efficient. So all these things are coming together from our discussions. Okay. Uh, with high ATP, high ATP makes the KM a lot different, a lot higher. And so it basically slows this down, makes it harder and less efficient. Okay. Um, when, I, when I said slows it down, I mean, the VMAX stays the same, but the, what I mean is that you need a lot more substrate to keep it going. So it's a form of regulation. You're shutting it down by changing the KM. Okay. All right. Um, there's the other molecule, which is fructose 26 bisphosphate. This is the one that was the, it was abbreviated on the previous slide like this. 2F Um, six, uh, what was it, BP? Yeah, I think that's how it showed in the other diagram. So it's, this is, that was just the abbreviation for uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. It is also, um, it's a molecule that's um, kind of, in, that is very involved here, not kind of involved, very involved in regulating PFK. And basically, when fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is present, when it's present, then uh, PFK is more active and you favor glycolysis. Okay, so um, let's take a look at the next slide. So fructose 6-phosphate can form fructose 2,6-biphosphate in a side reaction. Um, when you have an increase in fructose 2,6 uh, bisphosphate, what you're going to see is that you're going to have an increase in glycolysis. When you don't have it present in high amounts, then what that's going to mean is that you're going to favor gluconeogenesis. Okay, and um, I'm going to put an X on this slide. I think we start to get a little bit too uh, too much detail, I think, for what you guys need. Um, okay, there's some other 
uh, metabolic control uh, mechanisms. Um, I think what is important here is the idea that we have allosteric effects on these enzymes, molecules binding to other sites besides the active site that can either slow down or increase their function. So here is a summary, use a highlighter, for allosteric control, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Okay, so it is an allosteric activator of PFK. Remember, that is step three. Okay, and when it is present, Okay, when, when it's present, it's going to stimulate glycolysis. Okay, meaning that you're going to have uh, glucose go towards pyruvate. That process, step three is not, not per that particular group. Oops, I spelled that wrong. Okay, so you're going to stimulate glycolysis. Okay. Um, at the same time, 2, 6, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate inhibits another enzyme called fructose bisphosphates. And what that means is that it shuts down gluconeogenesis. So I'm going to put it more simply than this is saying, which is that this molecule helps to activate glycolysis, but shut off gluconeogenesis. Okay. Um, so really the balance between glycolysis and gluconeogenesis is really the concentration of this reaction of this, uh, excuse me, of this molecule. And that molecule, let's go back. Is the reaction from fructose six phosphate to fructose two bisphosphate? Okay, so um, in high amounts of this molecule, glycolysis is <clears throat> activated. So here, this molecule helps to uh, increase. Uh, the, gly uh, the glycolysis process because um, it essentially activates the enzyme involved in step three. 